yeah, you know, it's going to be one of those days. We're flying around all over the place. It's early. There we go. All right. So first off, I don't put the slate up. You see me before when we go live. Then after I put the slate up, you don't see me when we actually go live and it's time for me to talk. All right. So 905. And and now I'm officially torn because we now have two ways to go about introducing everything on a Friday. We can either go this way. Or those of us of a certain vintage can go this way. Uh, hmm. uh, come on, man. It's, uh, it's, go for it, dude. It's Friday. 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 Which means we got to go to Fado, and we're going to go catch up with Bart because there's a game going on right now as we speak. And it's part of a very, very busy show. Morocco in the U.S. And you're looping for some reason, sir. I don't know. I think I know why. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. We hear uh, Abby in the background yelling for Caleb Bailey as John Tolkien's on the ground. Uh, this is not commentary. This is uh, Atlanta. <laughs> it's observation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It is Good morning, y'all. Well, how was Vegas? Uh, not a long enough trip, John. Not a long enough trip, uh, but it was a good from a work perspective. So glad to hear that. Yes. And uh, Caleb Wiley on the sidelines, John Tolkien, and his blondness is now being uh, taken up and taken over the inline, kind of keep you with the neck a little bit. Uh, I don't want to turn this into like a diatribe because I know you've got to watch things. But if you see the hands and hands so far as we get to this point of the tournament. Well, I think first off, I just want to point out that this particular stadium is where the women are playing tomorrow. And uh, they won two matches here in 2019 on their way to their fourth World Cup. So, you know, there's your history for the day. But uh, as far as the men go, this has been, I think we all agree that the France match was... Uh, not as bad as the scoreline indicated. And you see what they were able to do against New Zealand and against Guinea. And it was controlled. It was uh, efficient. And if you can do that against Morocco yeah. today, you've got a really good chance. And both New Zealand and Guinea wins. Uh, you did not have the lion's share of possession. Uh, in fact, you were around 47% in those matches. Um, but you still created way more shots. And especially against New Zealand, doubled, actually tripled the amount of touches inside the box than your opponent did. So proving that, you know, possession is only as good as what you do with it. Um, hopefully this team kind of copies that more formula today and, and rides the confidence they've built over the past two games. Tim Howard mentioned in the pregame the difference between having two up top and three up top, and that seems to have unlocked them up there, folks. What have you seen with the change in formation? Yeah, I think um, it's just allowed a little bit more options for our guys to pass to and connect with, if that makes sense. Um, I felt like Duncan got a little isolated. I think it's really loud in here. Uh, I felt like Duncan got a little isolated, um, unfortunately. And, and while, again, I think it, he was good, uh, he was kind of up there all by himself. And so creating a more cohesive team structure by just kind of adjusting the formation a slight bit um, was a really smart move for Mitrovic. And, and again, I think if with this U23 squad, you've got to remember that I, as much as I like Duncan McGuire, I think he could have a bright future. He is not a superstar striker the way that you might have with Balligan or even Pepe or Sargent. So you're going to have to adjust to the players you have, not just in the squad, but also the best players you have and making sure that you're maximizing their potential. So what's the crowd like at Fido watching everything that we're not doing play-by-play for? Yeah, we got we got five of us right now as uh, we take a set piece. That Zimmerman puts in. Woo, Paxton may have been offside. Uh, Walker Zimmerman, kid from Lawrenceville. Yeah, Got to shout him out. <laughs> So you have Walker. We won't talk about what high school he went to, but he, he is from Lawrence. So. That, yes, that is true. Uh, <laughs> as, as a part of the uh, as a part of the Battle of Five Forks Trickham, we, we all know yes. about the, what's yeah. going on with, uh, with Walker Zimmerman. Outside the United States, how much of the tournament have you had the opportunity to look at on the men's and women's side? 
I mean, they're, they've been on, uh, John. I feel like I'm not alone in the fact that if, if I have the ability, the TV is on and it's on the Olympics. Um, and I think, you know, you look at this Morocco team specifically, they benefited from the chaos of match day one, but um, they still went out there and beat Argentina. You know, I mean, even if they had tied it, they, they still put two up on that team. Um, they've been pretty decent. Um, you know, I, I'm still confident that Argentina is probably one of the better teams out there right now. But um, the men's side is it's always weird just because whenever you get into these youth tournaments, um, you're not quite sure who's going to be available, who's going to shine. But then you add in the overage factor and then things get real crazy. But I, I'm still looking at Morocco and Argentina as teams who can, in my opinion, make um, hopefully, though, you know, if you're the U.S., you're, you're the one upsetting Morocco uh, today and silence all that they're, they could do because they are talented um, and they've got their overage players are, I mean, darn good. Uh, Hakimi's out there and that, that just scares me, you know. Yeah, Ashraf Hakimi has been known to scare some folks. Uh, women's side. Now, we we're getting ready for that matchup tomorrow. Emma Hayes and the team seems to be rolling right now. I think that probably the number that they put up on Germany is five. Out of the yeah, I think um, we we talked about this after the friendlies um, leading up to the um, Olympics set. They played really well. They just couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. Um, even against Costa Rica, a team that bunkered, they were breaking them down pretty regularly. Just. Not putting the ball in the back of the net, John, which um, I don't know if you're aware, but that's the only thing that really matters in this sport. And I, I, uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> you see against these two teams, uh, the last two teams, uh, Germany and then Australia, you know, you put the ball in the back of the net, things change for you, uh, especially against Germany, a comprehensively dominant performance. Um, I mean, I think Australia was a team that definitely bunkered. Um, so the difference between those two games, Germany was not afraid to play us, and you saw. I mean, you saw the ability of these women to get out on the break and, and punish teams. And, and that's kind of be the scary part if you're, I don't know, say Japan, a team who does like to have the ball and possess that if you give that ball away uh, anywhere in the midfield, this U.S. team is going to pounce on it quickly. And you saw that against Germany. But against Australia, a team that did bunker, you created chances. You had your opportunities. You got two goals. Um, probably could have had one or two more. And at the end, you know, you were just playing a, a team that's literally fighting for its life. Obviously, they needed to draw that game to assure themselves a, a chance to the knockouts, and they didn't. Um, and they threw everything they could at you at the end there. And there's that, that Hakimi dude. Um, <laughs> oh, no, that's Alkamich. Okay. Um, regardless, he's, he's got some good players on this uh this Morocco team, um, but yeah, it, it was it was probably more um, real reality, I guess. The Germany game was the dream, but the Australia game was reality, and the fact that you got a two-one win, mainly because you did what you needed to do, and at the end, Australia was fighting for their life, and you were already guaranteed advancement, so you didn't really have to worry too much about um, all the things. Oh, Schulte. That's the dude, or John. If, if that's uh, if you want to pick one dude who I think needs to start being on the senior national team, uh, I think it's Schulte. Um, I don't think he's necessarily a starter, but get that dude in that group of three goalkeepers who's uh, getting called up regularly. Yeah, you're a little ahead of me, so I see what you're talking about. Uh, before I get you out of here, so we can go and watch everything. I want to talk about Canada soccer and the implication of what we see. It's easy to make a dig, and we've been doing that all week. But Canada soccer, what do you, you thought about what's going on over there? Well, I mean, the dig is, is still the implication, though, John, and it's that you have to look at this program, program, not just this team right now, this program, and, and wonder how much of their success can you trust. Um, and I understand the players trying to say that one, um, you know, they weren't aware of this happening. Um, but you know, the men's been, side was. <laughs> well, that's the thing. As like, so the women are saying we didn't know it was happening. The men's side was like, you know, everyone does it, which I think is valid. Again, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Um, but 
the women's side trying to act sheepish and turn this into somehow to some sort of victim complex. I understand that's what you have to do in order to win a tournament, but you know, I don't feel sorry for them in one at all. And I, I hate to say that because there are some girls on that team that I have strong allegiances to, but um, I don't feel sorry for them getting punished for getting caught cheating. It's very similar to, I mean, NASCAR where every, we know everyone cheats. Um, but when you get caught cheating, that's a problem. It's like recruiting in football before NIL. We all know that everyone was cheating. Uh, but when you get caught, that means you're doing it in a messy manner and in a way that probably is also getting you a little bit more of an unfair advantage than others. And it, it does just, you have to question what their success in the past, you know, four or five years truly is now that you know what they've been doing to gain advantages in each game. All right, go watch the game. We'll catch up with you Monday. All right, y'all. Have a great one. Enjoy your Friday, and we'll be back uh, here at Fado 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for the women. All right, so we'll see you Monday. Enjoy, enjoy your weekend. Be good, my friend. So Bart's there. Uh, so if you're anywhere close to Fado Midtown, then you can go hang out with Abby and Bart and anybody else that got up really early that wanted to have an Irish breakfast and go watch the U.S. and Morocco. Uh, thought it was important even with the, the party atmosphere. And I did get to see a little bit of video of Bart and Abby before we came on the air and I screwed up the intro and all of the sequencing, but uh, Bart's back on this side of the, uh, this side of the Atlantic uh, after his trip to Vegas. And so we decided we were going to let him watch what's going on with, uh, at, with uh, the U S uh, national team. And Jack McGlynn now is the proud owner of a yellow card in the 16th minute. Yeah, it's a professional pull now. Yeah, well, and uh, and I don't know why the Moroccan player felt compelled to grab an ankle after he was grabbed on the shoulder, but, uh, you know, set piece from 22, 23, so somewhere in there. Uh, I don't know how the folks at Fado were ahead of the rest of us, but anyway, uh, very, very busy day, and uh, four card is not wrong that it is a full day of the sport from now until 5 o'clock Eastern time. 9, 11, 1, and 3 when it comes to what you're staring at with the uh, the soccer tournament and going over juice boxes and scheduling and all of that. So once again, no matches overrunning each other. 11 o'clock, Japan and Spain from Lyon. And that one did have juice boxes attached to it, but then all of a sudden the juice boxes disappeared. I don't know what happened. Uh, so Schulte makes uh, another grab in the 17th minute, and so they are still goalless. Japan and Spain right now at uh, 11 o'clock. That one's on Universo and Peacock. And now I'm going to have to, from scratch, try and figure out what the uh, the juice boxes are in, in this particular tournament. So is it World, I guess? I guess it's world. No, it's world friendly. Uh, no, it's six o'clock and that's fiend. I don't need that. Uh, okay. So it is, it is world slash Olympic games. All right. So Morocco came into this one at a plus 129. Draw in the U.S. a plus 222, basically. 11 o'clock, Japan and Spain. Spain favored heavily on the minus side at a minus 110. Draws a plus 231. Japan is a plus 332. One o'clock, Egypt and Paraguay. Paraguay favored at a plus 139. Draws a plus 216. Egypt is a plus 211. Three o'clock, this is uh, the home team, France. France. Even money at a plus 100 going up against Argentina. Argentina is a plus 284 and the draw is a plus 235. So um, that one might be one to keep an eye on. Keep an eye on that. So those are the juice boxes in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. What they do is they've taken apparently only 12 juice box purveyors, throw them in a pile, take the average, and it's a rolling average. So those are your numbers getting into the uh, the activity on the men's side for today. Uh, speaking of today, here's the deal. Here's the deal. All right, so very, very busy show. And obviously getting Bart in early. So 10 o'clock starting hour number two is our preview of the NPSL title game. 
and we will have our friends from FC Motown, and we will have our friends from El Fadalito joining us at 10 and 1020. For FC Motown, it's GM Gregory Irwin. And for El Fadalito, it is manager and head coach Santiago Lopez. And so with the national championship being this weekend at Drew University in New Jersey, El Fadalito has made their way from one end of the planet to the other. And we're catching up with them uh, where if they were still on the, the left coast, it would be breakfast time, 720 in the morning right now. But in or when they'd be set to join us. So 620 in the morning right now. If uh, so, they're on the East Coast getting ready for the, the final at Drew. And that will be uh, coming up at 10 and 1020. We'll catch up with FC Motown and El Fadalito and get uh, all caught up for the NPSL championship game. Bit of a, you know, just a bit of an education on them and what's going on and what these franchises have been through. FC Motown chasing after yet another uh, appearance in the last match of the year in the NPSL, chasing after another title. El Fadalito, uh, we ran a story in the NPSL Weekly. Uh, about what they mean to the fabric of the community there in Northern California, there in the Bay Area. And so these interviews will be uh, brought together and they'll be posted after uh, the show is over later today. So you can listen to that and get you ready for the championship game. Remember, USL League Two title, Seacoast United Phantoms going up against Peoria City. And so we'll have the, uh, the Peoria City interview that we had earlier this week back on Tuesday. That'll be posted to the network as well later today. And we'll catch you up on how Seacoast knocked off Asheville City and had that as a uh, part of the uh, dynamic in the title games that we have here. 21st minute, Morocco and the U.S. are scoreless. So once again, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, get you ready for the weekend in hour number two. We'll get you through Leagues Cup and we'll go through scenarios. We'll tell you what happened last night and we will we'll get everything all laid out for you and and sit there and uh, go through permutations, combinations, things like that. But it is looking more and more like uh, the uh, Atlanta United situation. If they win, then they and they advance. It looks like they might be playing uh, Cincinnati. If they are the two coming out of group, they might be uh, heading to uh, Cincinnati. If Cincinnati works their way through, Mike Conti had come up with uh, combinations and permutations this morning. He says if Atlanta United defeats Santos Laguna. It would be the winner of Cincinnati and NYCFC. If it's Cincinnati, it's a road match. If it's NYCFC, they play at Bobby Dodd in Leagues Cup. So we'll keep an eye on uh, we'll keep an eye on that. So that's your scenario for Atlanta United. We uh, will catch up with folks and uh, get their thoughts. But yeah, what what I wanted to do to start off the uh, the show is I know how sometimes on uh, Fridays we will have a certain way to bring the everything uh, bring everything into a friday and so that was you know, i actually found it and so i found this this was the easier thing to find it's friday, friday, gotta get down friday. and that we know and i shit, rebecca black is better at that than i am in, in as much as uh, i drive people crazy with my version but the other version is something tied to a certain age group here in the, the headquarters of, uh, of SDH. You know, we, if, for those of us of a certain age, at uh, 5 o'clock on Friday afternoons, a, a great radio station had that as uh, their lead-in to the weekend, the Friday 5 o'clock whistle. And so that was where uh, I found it. And I decided to pull that section, and I have the longer version that I probably will do to end the show. And I know, Four Card, it's not Friday, Friday, Friday. I know it's not that. Uh, I'm hoping that by doing that, I didn't screw up my voice, considering that no, summer colds suck. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Uh, halfway through the uh, 23rd, uh, shot blocked. Schulte with the easy grab off the header in the second chance. So we're still goalless there. Uh, well, Bam, I mean, it's, Bam is like Friday, I'm in love. Uh, I, I feel like I, you know, I probably will end up, but I don't want us to get in trouble with the music police. Although what I end up doing is if it's less than seven seconds, it's a sample. And that's how we can kind of get around the, uh, the, the, the laws of the game, so to speak. And so I, I try to make sure that 
Uh, anything in that musical vein doesn't get us tr in trouble. And so if it's less than seven seconds, it's a sample. And that's why Rebecca Black ended up being four seconds. So that way I could get that played. Uh, let's see. Who's in this morning early? Bam's in this morning early. Or for Bam, it's late. Morning, Tom. Morning, Abby. And uh, let's see. Four card. Yes. See, four card has it right. Four card's got a morning watch along. SDH coffee and work. Four card is right on. It is work when the uh, the U.S. national team is playing. Nine o'clock on a Friday morning. Why you want to do that, man? I mean, I know that the having the the French national team as your late game, you know, evening prime time. I get it. I, I get that. But you want to have breakfast in the East Coast. I mean, if you're gonna, if you want to make it breakfast, then make them the noon game. You know, then that way you'd have lunch on the East Coast breakfast on the west coast and so that way two meals are satisfied and so you've caught you've got an entire country completely and totally paralyzed watching a soccer match as it should be but you're dealing with three separate time zones here and so right now it's breakfast on the east coast or you know maybe leaning toward brunch and on the west coast you got folks just waking up that doesn't seem fair you really want to paralyze a country so they can watch a soccer match. What you do is you make it multiple, you make multiple meal availabilities out of this whole thing. That's what you do. Make it lunch hour. So lunch hour on the East Coast, everybody's locked in. Breakfast and brunch as you go through the country and then breakfast on the West Coast. That's how you completely paralyze a country. Make sure that nothing happens in a productivity sense. But no, we want the U.S. to be leadoff going up against Morocco. So we're going to have you at 9 a.m. Irish breakfast and then cups of coffee elsewhere. And Bam is watching us before he goes to bed. And of course, Bam is asking us, how are we all enjoying Team USA being second on the medal tally? Give it time, brother. Give it time. So, but yes, four card is of the right mindset this morning. And we thank four card for that. Morning watch along SDH coffee and work. I hope that you're actually consuming the coffee and not just watching the coffee. Uh, yes, for all day soccer between now and five o'clock. Bam said the Tillies overachieved at the Women's World Cup missing players with ACLs for Olympics hurt them. And uh, okay, another Moroccan player down after contact. Uh, Miles took us, uh, eh. and so it looks like halfway through the 27th, Miles is having a discussion. And like I said, we can't, uh, we can't do play by play. So. Center ref is having a discussion with the captain on the deal. Brings Georgi Mihailovic over. Pat on the back. And it looks like you've got a PK call that's under review. I feel like I need to have like some kind of music underneath this while we're kind of looking at what's going on here. We can't. Yeah, and, and Irish coffee too. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So I guess it looks like Hakimi is ready to take the alleged penalty as we continue to review here. And so, all right. So it is a penalty. And Patrick Schulte with the deep breath and the toweling off. Getting the reminder from center ref. Hey, man, you got to have one foot on the line. And so Schulte 
Like I said, and I'm behind, so obviously if anybody is in the timeline and, and has an end result, go ahead and post it. Got it under Schulte 1-0 halfway through the 29th minute. So PK, yeah, so 1-0, and Morocco with the lead. So that's where we are. All right, so 9.30, and, and uh, yeah, it's so I, I'm not going to mention a thing about timing. I am not going to mention a thing about timing at all because it is that time to catch up with our buddies from Beyond Gold. So, Cap, do you have a monitor near you? So can you double, can you multitask? I was watching it in the other room. I had to, that's why I'm a little late because I had to watch the penalty. No, no, no. So was it a penalty in your mind? Yes. Okay. So, so silly. You can't do that. You can't volley a ball in the box when there's 12 guys in the box because you don't know who's around you. You have to go head that ball. So silly. You take a, you take a swing and you make contact with another player. Player goes down and you end up now uh, behind the uh, behind the magic eight ball. Uh, Sufan Rahimi with the PK. It's 1-0. Uh, I, I love, by the way, that you are styling and profiling with your with your stars and stripes gear. You know, you were ready yes, dialed up this morning, as as was I in, from a different setting. Um, what have you thought about the Olympic tournament so far? What have you thought about? I don't know how much of it you've had the opportunity to watch, but what have you thought about the men's and women's sides so far from Paris? Yeah, it's been good. Um, yeah, I think that the women are handling their business um, <clears throat> as expected. Uh, they're fun to watch. I mean, their their attack is just dynamic. Um, you know, Rodman and uh, Swanson up there and uh, Sophia Smith just causing havoc. Um, so they are really fun to watch. Uh, I really enjoy watching them. And, you know, the men have done well. Um, they did good to get out of the group. I thought that was a little unfair, the 3 0 result against France. They didn't play that bad. Um, and then did what they needed to do um, the other two games. So that was good. And, you know, you're always going to play a good team in this round. So, um, yeah, you just never know. And hopefully we can turn it around and play a little bit better here in the rest of this game because uh, Morocco, they're flying. They're They're very good. I was going to say, when you got Ashraf Hakimi as one of your overagers, you know, that, that's that's never a bad thing, you know? Yeah, but <laughs> the Olympics in general have been awesome. We, we every night, watch the 8 o'clock, you know, live. Well, it's not live, but, uh, you know, they do the highlights of all the big stuff. So, you know, we're watching the swimming and the gymnastics, and we're looking forward to track for sure. All right. So I was going to say, what else have you, what else have you been watching? But uh, so then do you, do you put earmuffs on during the day, considering that it's five hours ahead and, and you're like, uh, you know, here's, I don't want to know. It's like, la, 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 you know, you're kind of working your way through the day and then you watch it at night or do you actually know what's going on and then still watch? Yeah, I've been trying to stay away from it. The only thing that I saw accidentally was that the U S woman won the team gold before I wanted to know that. But, <laughs> you know, we watched the individual last night and I didn't know um, Simone won gold before. So that was that was fun to watch. And then, um, yeah, the swimming is a little easier because it's not as broadcast as as the gymnastics. What the heck is going on with my hat? Oh, um, it's, oh I don't know. I mean, your, your hat's got a mind of its own. But I'm sitting here and I'm looking at Moroccan players with a 1-0 lead going down off the the uh, the slightest contact oh here we go yeah uh walker makes contact <laughs> with hakimi or, 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 or rahimi oh he got the ball first and oh whatever oh child please did you get a yellow uh no, i i have not seen a card being brandished but rahimi kind of like stepped over walker and now he's down getting his right ankle looked at. And I think that the right ankle, as he was going over Walker, he stepped wrong. And so they're trying, he's trying to, to add one plus one and have it end up with a card for Walker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. We, we, got this, we got this kind of stuff going, man. This is. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They got, they got to work ahead of them. Um, we're going to have to fight back and yeah, it'll be tough. Yes, 34th minute, one nil. Um, so then I, I want to ask this with the, I want to ask about 
be representing your country and in the prism uh, of uh, mentoring and pressure situations and dealing with that since we're talking about it. And yes, I know I'm going to be looking over my left shoulder and giving updates, yeah. not giving updates because, you know, we yeah. can't we can't do play by play, but we can live watch. Um, all right. So in, in an international situation or just in any situation, really, when you're down one nil. How do you how do you tell mentees in a situation where you're having to to come from behind? How do you tell mentees about not getting caught in the quicksand of the moment and not turning one into two and two into three and just focusing on getting one back and making it a step by step thing instead of getting bogged down and end up falling further behind? Yeah, just that one oh is just um, it really doesn't change the way you play unless unless you're late, late in the game, right? One zero, you know, there's no panic um, because yeah, you're right. You know, although, although obviously two zero is the worst lead in sports. And yes, it is. It's the worst lead in sports. You'd also rather be up two zero than down two zero. Right. So you don't want to, yeah. Like you said, go down one zero, feel like you need to push right away, send eight people forward. And then all of a sudden you're down two zero and it's only the 30th minute. Yeah. <clears throat> so, for me, nothing changes when you go down one zero other than maybe like, okay, take the throw ins a little faster, take the free kicks a little quicker. Like let's, let's ramp up the, the pace of things, a little little bit of urgency, but as far as um, your individual play and team play and taking risks and things like that, it doesn't change. Not until probably past the 80th minute. When you're dealing in with a situation like that, where you know that you've got work to do, but then you have a team that is trying to the, – the team that's leading is trying to figure out what buttons they can push with the, with the center ref. And it's like, how far can we go? What can we call? And not get frustrated in a situation where they're trying to goad you into doing things and making your mm-hmm. situation worse. How do you, how do you have a uh, – I guess the, the, the calming influence and just making sure that you don't lose your head in this situation – with all of the noise going on around you, it's a hostile environment. How do you handle those kinds of things and, and make sure that, okay, I still need to work within myself, even though I know that there's this hell of noise going on around me? Yeah, it's difficult. And that's, <clears throat> it takes experience. Uh, it really does to be in that situation where you've got the stadium rooting against you and you're down and literally all you want to do is push the game, push the game, push the game. And this guy's laying down on the ground for four minutes and you know, darn well, you didn't touch him and he's just faking it. Like that's super, super frustrating. Right. Uh, And you literally want to just go over and really kick him. Um, But yeah, you have to obviously keep a, keep ahead and, and, you know, we've seen situations I've you know timeless time time and time again we see situations where you know you fall victim to it and um, you do lash out at some point and that's exactly what will cost you um, your team the ability to come back so absolutely just just it. Did it, <clears throat> when did you learn self-control? I mean, or is it something that still is learned as you're going through your career? When, when did you have that idea of, okay, I'd like to do something, but I know it's detrimental. When, how long did it take you to, to get the idea of, okay, I've got to calm things down and navigate situations instead of getting completely and totally ripped out of shape about something? Yeah, I think I've always been pretty calm because it's just my demeanor. But I do remember the first time that I experienced it was Dallas Cup. I don't know how old I was. It was in young high school, so probably somewhere between 14 and 16. And I was spit on. By, um, Whoa. For the first time. Yeah. Whoa. And um, that was the first time that I was like, oh, wow, like there is levels to uh, this game that I haven't experienced before. Um, and you know, the referee didn't see it and, you know, I didn't lash out or anything, but um, that was the first time that I really wanted to. Um, But yeah, it just, for me, the demeanor for me was always like, Hey, you know, got to look after the team and don't do anything selfish. Well, and then when it came to having these kinds of discussions with your teammates set piece for Morocco here, early 39th minute from, Oh, let's say, 
18 or so extended over on the far hand side, a couple of yards away, about five yards away from the far touch line. So we'll see what happens up and over everybody. So that didn't do anything. Um, when you're w- around your teammates and you know that some of them run a little hotter than others, <clears throat> the navigation of you being the level head and making sure that the guys who run a little hot make sure that that engine's a little cool over Mm -hmm. time, knowing that they're getting their buttons pushed. But at the same time, the guys whose engines run a little colder, make sure that they get, you know, dialed into, and it's, it's, look, it's okay to, to be a little emotional about those things. When you're the guy in the middle, how difficult is it to navigate the guys whose engines run a little hot to bring them back to normal. And then the guys whose engines run a little cold to bring them up and bring their temperature up. Yeah, it's 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 usually tougher to bring the the high guys down. Um, I was probably lower than middle, um, and so I benefited from guys that I played with in Atlanta, like Leandro and, and Joseph, that were, you know, towards the top, and uh, or even Brad in the back. Right, he runs towards the top, and so you do feed off their energy sometime, which is great. Um, but yeah, they're in game. You have to make sure that you're aware to. Uh, help out when someone that you know on your team can get hot doesn't get hot, um, you know, or, or gets the right amount of hot. It's okay to play with emotions and be fiery, right? But uh, we definitely don't want a line to be crossed. It's going to cost us going down a man or something silly. Do you have those discussions with mentees about the run about making sure that their engine only runs a certain way or, or self control or however you want to phrase it? Do you have those discussions with mentees about? making sure that they can navigate the, the clutch and the gas. Yeah, for sure. It's one of the, one of the major things we talk about is like, you want to play with emotions and figuring out how you do run and how you get the most out of your performance and uh, emotionally what gets you there. Right. But also recognizing no matter how you run, right. Can we stay relatively neutral? Um, you know, especially in heated moments um, when we need to be, controlled and so <clears throat> we talk about ups and downs and you know there's always an emotional roller coaster throughout every game but um you know how quickly can we get back to neutral um you don't have to you don't have to get back to positive if you're playing terribly uh but can you get to neutral or it's not affecting you and affecting the next touch and the next play that and uh, i mean that to me especially in, in a an environment where you're chasing after a, a trophy or chasing after a title or chasing after some kind of recognition for the club that you're in. I think I would think that that adds that extra level of having to be self-aware about the situation. It's not just a normal kickabout, but it's like, okay, there's something else here that's on the line. And it takes that extra bit of self-awareness and self-attention. So you understand the context of what's going on and don't damage a, what you're trying to do and what your team is trying to do. It's, it's not, it's, it's a different day. It's not just a normal day out there. Totally. And, you know, it's easier said than done. Shoot. We see the guys at the highest level, right? Our national team have, have got guys thrown out of games recently that really hurt us, obviously Copa America. Um, but I, I forget what world cup qualifier before that, where, yeah, it's just silly off the ball things that guys get in the red and, aren't able to come down from it or, you know, don't have the teammates get in front of them to help them out quick enough. Uh, so, you know, it is easier said than done. And it, that's why I said it takes the experience. And yet, and even these guys are experienced and have gone through it and they still run too red sometimes. Um, that's, that's always going to happen because some of the best um, athletes are just so competitive that, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's to their detriment, but it also makes them, who they are as a player. So you take the good with the bad and hope that the bad doesn't hurt the overall team. Um, you know, like it did in Copa America. Halfway through the 43rd, still one nil and uh, Morocco trying to send a cross inside uh, the 18 around the six U S defends. And not that we're doing play by play, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. How'd you do? How'd you do? But uh, Morocco still in possession down the left. Sounds like we're going to need to make some changes at halftime to get on the ball a little bit more. Cause it seems like it's been one way traffic. 
Yeah, and yeah, we'll get into the numbers and things like that. And speaking of which, it's, it's halftime with our buddy Michael Parkhurst. Uh, at MF Parkhurst on the Twitters. And it is uh, at Beyond Goals Mentoring here for the Friday Free Kick. So uh, we we figured at the very least we could navigate the the rest of the first forty five going on in Paris and then take halftime and and uh, Brent and make sure that the engine stays right there in the middle between the the H and the C before we get get you out for the second half and I, I can't thank you enough on a national day where <laughs> where you get to drop in and, and actually have to to put up with questions about this kind of stuff. Oh, um, I enjoy it, John. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Rhode Island FC a little bit. Uh, you're still converting draws into wins north of the playoff bar. Uh, the Eastern Conference in the USL Championship we know is a street fight. A- and you're you're getting a club that is now getting adjusted to each other. What's it been like to see the, the early frustrations and leading the league in draws with like 72 draws in your first 20 matches? Uh, now converting those into wins for you, for your Rhode Island FC. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, obviously, we've we've been close for a while, and you, when things aren't going as well as you want them to, you're trying to convince yourself that you know, hey, look at the bright side, find the positives. That hey, we're close, um, we're doing things the right way, and kind of stay the course without overreacting and. Um, doing something that's going to hurt us for the rest of the season or beyond. And so I think that we did a really good job of that. Um, Kano Smith, the head coach and the team, you know, just stayed after it and we were really close and our results against the top teams in the league have shown us that, you know, we are right there. We're the only team to win at Louisville this year um, and put five up on them. At, yeah, you at did. That. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, some of the top teams in the West too, we've, we've tied. Uh, so we've been right there, but it's, it's always nice to finally get those wins to kind of pile up a little bit or five, five wins, two ties in our last seven. So it's, it's been a really good run. Um, or I think we're on national television on Saturday. I'm going to, me and the family are going up to Detroit to watch the game. Oh, you, so you're going to keyword going to Detroit. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, um, do you have a uh, noise canceling headphone? <laughs> I do not. I do not, but I will enjoy the atmosphere. That's well, sure. I know that you will, but some of the things, uh, five minutes added, by the way, and we're already in the first minute of the five right now with uh, Morocco still leading one nil. And it looks like they are just quite, uh, happy with, uh, you know, sort of cycling the ball from right to left and seeing what happens. Uh, in the the final four minutes of the first half, with time added on, but I have I have known the crowd there at Keyword to uh, to believe in colorful metaphors, and I didn't know if there were ears that would be a part of the Parkhurst clan that would be making the trip to Detroit City that may not uh, that may not need to be hearing those kinds of things. Uh, I didn't know if the traveling party was going to be accepting of what might be said by the fans at Keyworth on the weekend. That's why. Yeah, the traveling party hears everything. So um, (laughs) we're not concerned about that. Okay. Um, But yeah, as long as, as long as it's all in good nature and not towards us and everything. So we'll see, we'll see how the experience is, but uh, now we're looking forward to it. It'll be a good game. We're tied. I think we're tied with Detroit or they, they tied on Wednesday. So maybe they're a point ahead of us either way. We're really close. Uh, So it's a big game. When it comes to patience, and, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to ask about the season with Rhode Island FC. And we, we all talk about patience as a club, patience as an individual within the construct of, uh, of what a team success is trying to do over a year. Do you find that, that your mentees, when it comes to trying to chase after results, are do they understand that, that it's okay to be patient or do they have this immediacy that's attached and you've got to have that, you know, it's like got to win it, got to win it, got to win it. Or are they actually patient when it comes to trying to achieve goals these days? Yeah, I think it's tough to have that delayed gratification. Um, We definitely try and talk about enjoying the process and learning from our experiences, good and bad. Uh, And so obviously there are some games that mean a little bit more, but um without these losses and without these tougher times, really, we can't, we can't get to our ultimate level. Uh, so 
some of them understand that and some of them it's, it's tough, right? You don't want to go out there and lose. Nobody wants to go lose a game or play poorly or anything like that. Uh, so that's, that's for sure not the goal, but um, just understanding that this is, it's part of the process and going through these experiences gets us to our goal um, and even creates our goal sometimes. Uh, two minutes to go here in added. Looks like a foul was called on the United States as Hakimi split two defenders toward the top of the arc. Uh, let's see. Uh, kind of a coming together. And it might have been on Aronson. So set piece from, let's see, 26 or so. So we'll see what happens here with about a minute 20. Uh, to answer your question, Detroit City's ahead of you on wins. Eight to six, they have a match in hand, and they have a, a better goal difference. So uh, eight to six in wins and better goal difference, and that's why they're in sixth and you're in seventh, both at uh, 28 points. So that's mm. that's where yeah, they're in sixth and you're in seventh. Four o'clock start, though. I don't want you to get, like, lost in the, the trip to, to Wayne uh, Wayne International where it's like, what time are we late? No, it's a four, <laughs> four o'clock kick in Hamtramck. So, I mean, that's uh, – yeah, they switched it from seven to four for TV. So hopefully it won't be too toasty out there. I don't know. We'll yeah, and like. that, that turf surface at, 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 at Keyworth it has been known to have a couple of interesting hops. And that's the, the phrasing that I'll use is that it's interesting hops there. And there are no, there is no buffer from like sideline to fans. I mean, literally. Absolutely. It's very tight. Very tight. Everything is right on top of you when it comes to, to that kind of a uh, – that kind of a setting there. All right, so 20 seconds. And, and uh, yes, I'm going to filibuster here a little bit. Once again, no I'm about, do. I'm about 25 or six, well up and over everything. And so I think that's pretty much going to do it for the first 45 plus five. Morocco with the one moment. And you end up with a penalty converted past Patrick Schulte. Multiple replays are showing that the last set piece went well over the bar and into the crowd at the Parc de Prince. And uh, waiting for our center ref to sit here and look at his look at his timepiece and blow a whistle. Well, as you're giving us that play by play, I'll answer the question. Well, that's, that's, that's not a play by play. Remember, we can't do play by play. It is halftime, by yeah. the way, one nil. So, a question for Parky: If you could sign one player from England to join your team, who would you want to sign? It's a good question, but uh, I I think right now I'm choosing Mano. Is that how you spell it? Mainu? Yeah, yeah, Kobe, Kobe Mainu. Mainu. Um, just because obviously he's a baller, but he's young, um, still growing, and a baller in the midfield. And it's so difficult to find that player that can be a true eight in the midfield, um, that can go both ways and beat guys off the dribble and uh, really create the game in that sense um it's a tough position to find like the nagby-esque player uh so yeah i'll take him okay well yeah and hey you get get him get him young and uh, manchester united needs the money and so i know that uh, that you and, and the rest of the ownership group there at rifc could sit there and put together a couple of bucks and go get kobe Mainu. uh it might be like eight to the left of the decimal place and like maybe closer to nine at this point you think <laughs> You, you think you guys could kind of postpone the build, the stadium build and sit there and take that money and reinvest it in Kobe Mainu and bring him over for Manchester United? The largest transfer in the history of USL Championship? Mm, that would be a tough ask for uh, him to say, hey. I'm going to go to Rhode Island, but you got yeah. Italian, you got Italian food on the top of the hill, man. It's some of the best. Yeah. I, I mean, it's beautiful here in the summer. You're, you're, you're looking at some of the best carbs that you could possibly get. <laughs> And you get to, to stay in shape as an athlete, which reminds me, by the way, how is uh, how's the stadium going and uh, everything getting ready for the, the, the build of Michael Parkhurst Estates? Mm. Uh, it's going well. Uh, it's looking like we're on track to be done, I think, end of March, early April. So we may have to start on the road for a few games, but um, it's coming together. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's every time I see pictures of it, uh, it's incredible. The transformation that's taking place. I still remember when I first signed up with Atlanta United touring Mercedes Benz stadium when they were still constructing it. And, uh, you know, just seeing that over time is, you know, obviously it's a way grander scale, but, um, you know, similar, just, it'll be cool to see it come to life. You know, we, we've always talked about what it's been like to be a part of something from the ground up and, and all of these kinds of special moments along the way. Uh, where's your hard hat? Do you have, do you still have your hard hat? 
from the construction site? Mm -mm. Nope. It was borrowed. What? So, uh, I didn't keep it. Oh, you gotta, you gotta have that. You gotta have that under glass behind you, man. Like everything else that's there. <laughs> hey, this is my hard hat for my stadium construction. It's not too late, at least from the Rhode Island one. It's still yeah. too late for the MBS one, but uh, I mean, that, for Rhode Island. that that would be, you know, to to go up there. It's like I just take a special trip, go up there. And it's like, no, I need the hard hat. It's like, well, why are you here? It, every, you see the stadium. But it's, no, I need the hard hat. And you take the hard hat. You just kind of smuggle it out, you know, with you as, as you go. Uh, what is going on these days with Beyond Goals? What are some of the the uh, the the tackle it, the issues that you guys are tackling these days, you and Greg with your mentees. Yeah, we are gearing up for uh, fall. So we've got a, you know, an August push going on where we've got a discount code going on for anyone that wants to sign up for mentoring. And so uh, we know that this, this will be a busy season as kids get back into it. Um, so that's, that's exciting for us. And uh, we've got the video library. Um, that we've uh, named BGTV. Oh, uh, there you that go. Is debuting here very, very soon. Nice. Uh, so excited about that. And then we've got a, um, the project with Atlanta City Public Schools um, that we are trying to kick off here in the next probably three or four weeks. Uh, and that'll be a big project for us leading into all the way into the World Cup. Uh, so uh, excited about those things. Um, the mentoring, we did a lot of um, tryout season stuff lately, how to prepare for them, how to take it, how to handle it, um, how to be a new teammate, uh, how to uh, welcome new teammates if you're on the other end. Uh, so as, as players are trying to get on new teams, experiencing new things, um, just helping them through that process. What's the discount code? Do you remember it? Wow. I absolutely should, John. <laughs> Uh, it's something like preseason something. So go to, go, to, go to the website. Go to beyondgoalsmentoring.com. Yeah, don't go, don't go ask to, the owner. Go to, go to BG Mentoring and uh, and go that way. And then, uh, oh, what's the thing with APS that you New mentioned? Season 30, N-E-W-S-Z-N, because okay. we're so hip. Ah, yes. N-E-W-S-Z-N-3-0. Okay. What's uh, what's this thing? What's, what, what are you talking about with uh, uh, APS? What's going on there? Um, we're taking a group of high school kids and we are mentoring them and helping them out with, uh, basically we're talking about opportunity and access. And so we are going to, um, bring a bunch of public speakers to them. We're going to bring them around and show them a few different things and talk to them about mentoring and their journey and hopefully culminating with, uh, some opportunities for these, uh, young people at the world cup, uh, for jobs or internships and things like that. So just to showing them the world of sport that doesn't involve being an athlete and the opportunities that are out there. So, uh, yeah, excited to hopefully get that rolling soon. As always at MF Parkhurst for the Friday free kick at BG mentoring on the Twitters and go and find beyond goals mentoring and use the, uh, the code. If it's applicable, any W S Z N three zero Rhode Island SC on the, on the dome. Stars and bars every place else. It's a very, very busy day. Go get your breakfast. We're still at the half. Go enjoy the second half. Thanks as always, my friend. We'll see you next time. Thanks, John. Enjoy the game. Have a great weekend. All right. There goes Parky. And so uh, the hot tag is is going gonna, is gonna to happen here in just a little bit. We're going to start our NPSL championship preview here in hour number two. We're going to start things off with our friends from FC Motown. And with that, it's GM Gregory Irwin, who is getting ready to style and profile like nobody's business. That's the beauty of the green room, is I can sit here and see what they're, what everybody's trying to do. I'm going to bring Greg in. Greg, good morning. You're this much closer to a title game, and I know that I'm catching you toward the end of the first half of the U.S. men's national match. So uh, I'll kind of keep an eye on it for the both of us. I won't be doing play-by-play but I'll be keeping an eye on it. Congratulations on making the last game of the year again in the NPSL. John, thanks for having me on. Um, it's really a pleasure. And yeah, we're really excited for it. It's been, um, it's been a great year and we're really fortunate to be playing the team that, you know, stole headlines uh, towards the early part of the year, making it the furthest in the, in the open cup. So we're really excited. When you 
look at this season on the whole, a question that I like to ask folks is, is that if I had talked to you before the season started and I had said to you that you would be playing in the last game of the year in the NPSL, what would you have told me? I would say, especially after, you know, our, our open cup game, it was club expectations to always make it this far, but we were, we were definitely a bit off. Um, you know, and there was definitely that gap, um, but going into, you know, week one, all, all those months away, it was get the first result. And that was kind of the, 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 the high mark, um, with the difficulty and, you know, some college guys aren't back away. It's still cold outside. You're traveling down to a game two and a half, three hours away in AC. It was just about winning week one. So when you look at this ride with folks that aren't there, your roster's not complete, you're having to juggle things, okay? It's like, I've got these guys, I've got these guys coming. How difficult is that for you as a club? And obviously it speaks to the coaching staff and to the guys that are there to, to navigate all of these hurdles. But how difficult is that for a front office and for a club knowing that you don't have everybody yet, you're getting everybody, and you think you'll be better down the line. How difficult of, of a start is that with all the stuff that you have to juggle? Yeah, so I think had this been year one for me, this is now year three, it, it would have seen, you know, in 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 the long term, like it, it comes around eventually. But from experience, you have to start motoring it at the beginning of the season if you're going to make a strong push at the end of the season. Um, and – it, it was, it was quite an ask. It was, you know, we were getting resources from around the club. We were having some, some vets play. We were having some of our, you know, guys playing through, through different areas of the club. And it was just about, can we put on a, a roster just to win the first one? And we knew how difficult it would be if we didn't get that first game, that first win. I think that was me sending out the, uh, the 280 character notification that you're on the show. That's what that was. Uh, when it comes to, the the environment that is there for someone and this is going to be this is going to be played at, at drew at, uh, at drew up there in new jersey for someone who doesn't know your footprint and doesn't know how integral soccer is to that part of the country how would you break down what the sport means and what fc motown means to the fabric of those that play and those that follow the sport so fc motown is a perfect microcosm of what football should be right? It's every person from every possible walk of life um, that you see in the New Jersey, New York area, that's really indicative of what it should be. You have, you know, kids that played in great academies that, you know, go to great big time schools alongside guys who work really, you know, hands-on jobs. We have um, players that are, you know, getting full division one rides at, you know, top tier universities. And we have guys that are, you know, driving FedEx trucks, working at the airport. And that is the perfect, you know, range that we look for. And it works. And we have, and everyone is pushing to say, how can I get the most out of each other? I, like, there's no other range you can have uh, that really spreads further than that. Okay. So who's the driver of the FedEx truck that's on the roster? <laughs> Um, you know, he's been our, he's been our MVP for, for years on end, uh, Gene Voltaire. Um, we're not releasing roster yet for, for, for tomorrow. Um, but he's been a part of the club for a number of years now, played in our national final back in 2022, has been a staple. Um, you know, another big name that's kind of around that ballpark, Mawindo Germain, um, played against Austin FC in the CONCACAF Champions League game last year. And, um, one of the best players, you know, at, at this level of the game and should be at a higher level and in, in, in everyone's opinion. Um, but again, it's really just guys that are that are mixing. And when we see, you know, people come into the locker room right before the game, it's they're so excited to see each other um, from every from every different walk. Well, you know, if you wanted to break your roster news this morning, you know, you could do that. Just just put that out there. Um, <laughs> when when you have someone who has that normal nine to five job or, you know, 40 hour work week and they come into the locker room, they come into the, the FC Motown environment and they take off their work clothes, their, their nine to five work clothes. They put on that. They put on that uniform. They put on that kit, and then they go out and represent. 
How do you think that rubs off on the rest of the locker room where you have all of these different walks of life, whether it's the, the professional athlete, the college, the professional athlete that had a career, the college athlete looking for that next step, the guy that's got the 40 hour work week coming in. How do you think each one of those ideas rubs off on the rest of the roster? So you have that cohesiveness where you can be chasing it. Yeah. So I think it goes in, in, in two answers. First, is we, you know, as, as a club behind the scenes or my job behind the scenes, everyone's jo- we try and make sure that everyone's role or specifics is what they have to hit the maximum of. The coaches don't worry about player logistics. Players don't worry about anything but player playing. Um, the people I have directly under me, you know, whether it's equipment manager, social media people, they're all doing their responsibilities. So when the players arrive or the coaches arrive, it's just about them doing the game locker rooms taken care of far, far away. And, you know, we try and really run it like a professional organization. And that second part of it's, it's really, you know, everyone, you know, those guys who are, you know, maybe college players seeing, you know, stars of of yesterday that, you know, had those pro runs and, you know, they're, they're working those nine to fives. It's just really, you know, hitting that maximum again of if these guys are giving it everything and this is their one moment to, you know, let everything kind of go by the wayside and still relive, you know, the game they love, then there's no reason I can't meet that that same standard. Expectation for you has always been there. I mean, you've made it to the last game of the year, won titles in the past, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. How do you keep that expectation from weighing down on you too much? Because pressure can go in a couple of different directions. How do you keep that the pressure and the pressure of expectation as a positive to where it doesn't weigh you down every season? Again, I, I think it goes back each individual piece uh, that if we leave that the play, if we leave the players to just playing the game, we leave the coaches to just coaching the game. We leave the owners to just being owners and away from, you know, sticking their heads in the locker room and all those pieces. We're able to worry about one game at a time. And I remember, you know, two or three weeks ago now when we had those, that we had the regional semi, we had, or we had the conference final, we had the regional semi, and then we had the, 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 the regional final itself. Um, in between, right, we had that huge weather delay. So we go from a Saturday game, Wednesday game that didn't end at until 12, 1230. And then we have to play again that next Saturday. It was real. We really were able to focus in on one specific game at a time, rotate the roster, get the most out of every guy possible and not worry about, you know, how can we hold ourselves or thinking beyond. And when when we've really been able to think about one game at a time, like we talked about earlier in the show of that first game of the season, we've been able to really um, jump at it and, and not look too far ahead. FC Motown GM Gregory Irwin hanging out with us here as the eastern half of the NPSL title game coming up this weekend that they get to host here on the morning show on the, here on the SDH Network. When you look at what, FC Motown has been able to build uh, over the last couple of seasons, say the last four or five years, or since you've been there, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, What was the biggest lesson that you took from last year's team that applied to this year's team that has applied to this year's run? It could be something off the field. It could be something on the field. Uh, You know, it could be something from a a meeting room or a conference room or something where you're, you know, walking the streets and you had a revelation. It's like, oh, yeah, that. What was the biggest lesson from last year that you got to apply to this year that helped you with the successes here in 24? I think it was really balance. Um, There's a lot of great, great players in our area. There are guys who, you know, say it's time to leave the pro game and and, and come into to to this level of the game. Um, But it really has to be balanced. It has to be guys commingling. Um, We were really fortunate um, to have more college guys, honestly, in this year's run than we did prior and it really worked. Um, <clears throat> another really important feature, and it was you know apparent this year's Open Cup that it had to be prior years. We were playing a professional team far earlier um, than we would have in, in prior years. And had we not had kind of a lesson from players that were, you know, that, had we not had a lesson early on in the year, we probably wouldn't have done a facelift or, or seen how do we need to improve from an organizational standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, from a player standpoint to get to that first game. Um, had that, you know, had all those pieces kind of not folded together at the right time, maybe, you know, 
we play an amateur side first round and then we get to a second round and you say, you know, we had a good, good run by playing a pro professional team and a very, very good professional team, a very good professional organization in round one that went on to the last, I think it was the last 16 or eight. We probably wouldn't have had, um, you know, hit the nuclear button and say, we really need to fix this up big time. When you have a, a club that is as successful as yours and uh, you know, it is something that while it may take on a life of its own, it's always constant work. Everyone may sit there and look at the NPSL and go, okay, well, it's only from, you know, March to <laughs> March to August when it's far more than that. It's, it's the, it's the other months out of the year where all of this work happens to where March through August looks as easy as it is. How much work is it? Because, I mean, I, I would say that operating a franchise these days, it's almost like watching, uh, you know, it's the old analogy of throwing a, a stick in the lake and having <laughs> your, uh, your golden retriever go chase it. And so the golden retriever gets the stick and brings it back to shore. What you see above the shore is the dog with the stick in its teeth and, and you know, everything's calm above the waterline. But what you don't see is the dog doing all this to make sure that he gets back to shore. Mm-hmm. What What is the swim like for you and FC Motown in the months that are not on the field to make sure that everything is as 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 swimmingly, you know, well as it is during playing season? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Like my, myself, like a lot of other guys that are doing this, this is what we do on the side. Right. I have, you know, my own responsibilities in, a, in an office in Manhattan uh, during the day. And uh, for better or for worse, you know, my phone rings daily, um, especially this week, setting up for the national final. And it's indicative of everything going on. Um, it's a full time responsibility that you're somehow cramming into a, a, a part time or thing on the side. Um, it's it's a lot. Let, let's put it there. But I, I put it in and, and this hasn't you know, we didn't have this uh, circumstance this year. But like I said, like two years ago, right, when we flew out to Tulsa and then we're hosting the national final um, that that following week. When you're in college or you're a professional and, you know, you have an endless support staff and things are kind of planned times and ahead, it was, you know, game ended on that national, the, the team we were playing the national semi or national quarter on that Sunday. And it was, we have to fly out by Friday and you're budgeting, you're, you're getting the flight stuff done, you're getting the hotel, you're getting the logistics, all those little pieces that you don't think about that you have a team to do. Again, if you're in the professional ranks, you're in the college ranks, it gets smushed down into, you know, one individual. It's a massive ask. Um, And it's really indicative of, you know, amateur soccer on the whole or lower level soccer is an incredible amount of work um, beyond the professional ranks that people really um, have no no capability or no idea of in in reality. And that's why I wanted to ask about it, because you're talking about uh, staffs that are infinitesimal by comparison to, Mm -hmm. to pro staffs and things like that. How many different job titles do you think you have? even though your business card may say general manager, how many different job titles do you think you have inside the organization? How many different ones have you touched this year? Oh, uh, I'll put it like this. I remember showing up for the first open cup game when we played against NYCFC's MLS next pro game, setting out the locker room, folding the jerseys, whatever. And I was, you know, gladly there, you know, a good amount of time over. I opened the door and it was almost like a sea of, people, it was a sea of people coming out of the van to set up their locker room. It was probably about one to eight. Okay. So that would, and that's, and and that's just the people that were there before the technical staff got there. Um, (laughs) Let's see. GM equipment manager. We have an equipment manager now. Director of operations, media production, player liaison, coach liaison. Like it goes on. Uh, We're we're being generous. (laughs) Babysitter. I'm, like, I'm looking at the back of the business <laughs> card. That's getting full pretty quick. Uh, one last, actually, two more questions. And thanks for hanging out. Yeah, I'd say I'd say one to eight. Okay, one, one to, to eight. seven, one to eight. For someone who's going to be watching FC Motown for the first time, going up against El Fadalito this weekend, how would you describe style of play? If things are going well for us, we are doing blank. I guess it's the soccer version of match game. How would you describe what you guys do on the field? Yeah, I I would say you're going to enjoy the game. Um, This is as good as you can get for amateur soccer. There are a lot of guys in both rosters who deserve to be in the professional ranks and are doing this for a variety of reasons. Um, You're going to have a really packed atmosphere at Drew um, down in in Madison. Um, 
and you're going to enjoy a really good game. Okay, so my second question I'm going to hold because Santiago Lopez is hanging out with us. He's in the green room. I'm going to go ahead and bring Coach Lopez in yeah. because now that he's on this half of the planet, uh, Coach Lopez, John here, Greg Irwin, the GM for FC Motown. So it is a three-way dance for uh, one question in the crossover section. First off, glad you made it safely. Thanks for coming on the morning show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice and humid over here on this side of the country in this beautiful <laughs> region. Um, yeah, we're very, very happy to be on this side. It's the first time we play in the East Coast that I can remember. Actually, probably the first time in the club's history to play uh, on the East Coast. But uh, yeah, we're very happy. All right. So now that we're in the handoff portion of the program, uh, let me ask you this. Greg, If do you have a question for Coach Lopez? about El Farolito, about the business aspect, about NPSL in general. If you could ask Coach Lopez any question about El Farolito, what would it be? Yeah, which rest, which of the restaurants do I have to hit when I uh, when I travel over? Um, definitely the 24th and Mission location because next door we have a bar that is open until 2 a.m. We serve uh, margaritas. There's a sports bar. There's billiards. There's TV screens. There's, there's everything. It's a great energy and that's the original one that started in 83 there we go and so then coach lopez if you had a question for uh gm gregory Irwin, so if el farolito has a question for fc motown what's your question where do you get such amazing players uh, you have two teams uh, usl2 and then npsl that's that's amazing yeah 26 you'd think i'm 36 i'm losing my hair <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, we're, it's, you know, we're fortunate. And I think when you're in really hotbeds, um, like yourself and your part of the country and in our part of the country, when you, when you push down barriers to entry and just let guys play it, it's not just what the, you know, what the title is on, on their resume, um, where they've played before, you know, when you let guys come out and just play and you could be a kid from went to a big Academy and play at a big school, you can be a guy. And as we mentioned earlier from John, that, works, you know, a real blue collar job, works at the airport, works as a FedEx truck. When you just let guys play the game, you know, the game lets people show who are that, who are supposed to show. And I think it's really indicative of our club. And I think it's indicative of what people really should know about, you know, football in, in this country and, you know, how our teams like us can, can make it to, to this stage of the competition. Um, not worrying about resumes and things like that. Yeah, I agree. Amazing. All right, so one fun question before uh, I let uh, Greg go. Greg, as a GM, who would you rather take to play for your team, Holland, Mbappe, or Bellingham? I have to know what these guys are like behind the scenes because you'd be surprised as a, as a person who, who had the pro ranks for a bit and things like that. The, the greatest players, right, they, they can perform on the field, but for, for where I am in my role – if I have to get on a flight next year to El Farolito, I have to know that this guy's going to be willing to show up at the airport, not miss the flight and all those things. Um, but all three, gosh, <laughs> I love a counter presser. So let's go with Bellingham. All right. So there you go. Uh, Greg, uh, may the, may the weekend and may the championship game be a fantastic hosting experience for you. Thanks for dropping by the morning show. We'll catch up with you soon, my friend. Thank you, John and Santiago. I'll see you soon. Take care. All the best and congrats on making it this far. Thank you. Same. All right. All right. Coach Lopez, first off, thanks for coming by. Who would you rather take to play for your squad? Holland, Mbappe, or Bellingham? Um, uh, probably none. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're amazing talents for sure, but I agree with, uh, with Greg. Uh, we don't know. I don't know how they are personally, and I just can't make that that decision, especially talking about millions of dollars. No doubt about it. Uh, so what has this ride been like for you? And I mean that, I guess, both figuratively and literally coming over to the East Coast for a title game. What's the season been like for you? Yeah, it's been, a, a, for me, it's a, a, not a surprise in some ways, but uh, it, it's 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 great that the players have responded very well to the, the training method that we've been trying to implement this throughout the year. Um, they've applied it very well through throughout the season. They've been very consistent. They've been very healthy. They've been very professional. I think throughout the entire year, we only had one injury, and that injury only lasted uh, four four days. Um, another injury was probably for like a month. Uh, so there's been two injuries throughout the entire season, and 
everybody's been very professional and they've been preparing for each match week by week. So we're very, we're very fortunate to still be here and, 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 and have a, a complete roster. If I had told you at the beginning of the season, all things being equal, that you would be here in the last match of the year in the NPSL, what would you have told me? Um, I would have said no, because in the previous years, we've lost in the West Region Finals. Um, it's very unpredictable what could happen in the last minutes. Um, in 2022, we were up uh, for one goal in the 93rd minute. We tied, went to PKs, lost. Then the last year, we are winning 2-0. And uh, in minute uh, 90, they 2-1, they, they scored. And in the 103rd minute, they tied us and we lost in an extra time. So very unpredictable. I, 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 I couldn't guess anything, but hey, I'm very happy that the players showed up and they've been taking care of business every week. Not that we're doing play-by-play -play or anything, but Morocco still leads uh, Team USA in the 56th minute, 1-0 in the quarterfinal in Paris. Not that we're doing play-by-play -play or anything like that. We're just giving updates as to what's For going sure. on here in real time. Uh, when you look back at what you have been able to build there with uh, El Faralito in, in the NPSL, how difficult is it to maintain this level of success that you have been able to build knowing that you've gotten all these deep runs that you've been talking about, how difficult is it to, to maintain this level of success out West? Yeah, it's extremely difficult because um, uh, what I've noticed in the, in the past, you know, in my experience, one player could have a great season and then the next season they could be not so well. There's very few players that can maintain that level, that intensity, and obviously that professionalism. But uh, we've been very fortunate that we I discovered this uh, a group, a core group of players that this is their third year. And we're talking about like seven to ten players. And they've uh, invited other friends and recommendations. And we've added on and maintained the, the group at a certain intensity and level. And the new players that have came on have adapted very well to that energy. And it's worked out very well. So... It, it's very hard. It's very hard to, cre you know, create a core group and then obviously maintain it with respect and good discipline. What's it like to have that kind of a, a family? And I mean that with both capital F and lowercase f. What's it like to have that kind of a family that's attached to El Fadalito as it is and then bring in others under the tent who understand what it means to be a part and wear that name on, on their chest? Yeah, it's... um. Well, a lot of these guys love love to part, you know compete at a high level. They want to continue in their you know college uh, you know continue you know they want to play professional and continue in their in their development programs and and and, and perform at a highest level. So it's it's easy. I mean, it's it's as easy to to identify those players who really want to are hungry for that. So. Um, it's they identify with the high performance and the responsibility that is to be part of this club because every time that we play a team they know they're competing against uh, um, a very difficult team that is going to try their best so it's it's quite um interesting to 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 work with these type of players that they want to perform at a high level and and it's just great and, and not only that uh, great athletes are great people they're um, everybody has adapted very well and and outside of the of the pitch we've created a, a great bond and and I'm gonna give credit to the entire players not myself uh, I managed to group in a certain way but them themselves they create their own um, their own family and it's been amazing to see the the growth and the stability of that for someone who hasn't seen you play this year how would you describe style of play level of attack uh, you know, obviously, you know, film is out when it comes to uh, opposition and things like that. But for someone who hasn't seen you play, how would you best describe what you do offensively and defensively on the pitch? I think it could be um, uh, high intensity and technical. Um, there's we have some players that are very technical and and some players that are very um, physical. So we like to press high and we also like to counter. So we adapt to the situation. We like to play long ball. We like to play out of the back as well. I always believe in 
the game always presents you different tasks and different tests. I believe that a good group of uh, a good team should um, encounter and obviously it should um, know how to manage different situations of the game. How would you best describe you? We've talked about family both on and off the pitch, but how would you best describe El Farolito's place in the the, the environment there in the Bay Area on the whole? Because uh, I would imagine that uh, the family atmosphere on the field brings a, a family atmosphere from off the field, and those that want to come and see you on a weekly basis, they understand what what is there when it comes to El Fadalito. How would you describe your team as a part of the fabric of the soccer environment there in the Bay Area and its place in it? Um, great question. Well, we never really do consider us the best club in the area because there's obviously professional clubs like the Earthquakes. There's um, Now there's the Fresno Fuego um, in the Central Valley, and then you have the Roots. Um, but for us, I, I think we consider ourselves uh, – yeah, part of the, the Latino uh, football culture and uh, the 80s, um, the club started it's, it's, the club started in the 80s and and it was one of those uh, powerhouse uh, Latino clubs in the San Francisco League, which you had a lot of Europeans and American professional players at that time. So I think uh, they, they know us that we're one of the 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 the, the clubs that gives the opportunity um, to to new immigrants in the country that want to continue playing and they were, they just couldn't stay in the country and they're in around the area and they could, they have a place to, to, to still compete at a high performance and professional environment. What's it like to, to be that beacon, I guess, for lack of a better phrase in the, the soccer community and in the community in general there in the Bay Area? what's it like to be that coming together point? It's a lot of responsibility because you have to show good values. You, regardless if you win or lose, you need to show a good face. You, there's people that uh, some some kids, some new teenagers uh, are looking at us, and we have to show the good example to try to, you know, transmit the uh, the good football culture and you know, um, good good manners in the in the game because you know a lot of people love to win, but not a lot of a lot know how to win, and same thing as as losing. How difficult is it to run this club 12 months out of the year? And I asked uh, Greg the same question about FC Motown because I know a lot of folks will sit there and they'll look at the NPSL and they'll go, oh, yeah, March through August, when in reality it's a 12-month thing, but you only see March through August because of you know that's when the schedule is. What's it like doing something like this and keeping it alive for 12 months even when the schedule is only a few yeah it's a lot of uh a lot of hard work there's a lot of things behind the scene organization obviously preparation on my side obviously you have to continue your development as a coach as a as a leader um a lot of courses a lot of reading um that's uh in the whole you know soccer phase but the the organizational um people in the club that I'm very fortunate that they, they support with my decisions and my vision. And they, they help me out with, uh, obviously with the funding, some things of like trains and gears, uh, soccer fields and all that, because San Francisco is not very cheap. So it's always a struggle. Um, so we try to get, always get, get, have more trainings involved, but unfortunately, you know, I need a break. I need my, my time off as well. I, I need, I need to prepare myself. Um, and to, to perform well, you need to rest well as well. And, you know, I'm very, very grateful for my family that, that, that supports me with, the, with this journey. And you get ready for the last game of the year in the NPSL, taking on FC Motown tomorrow. Manager and head coach Santiago Lopez from El Fadalito. As always, it's great to, to see the story continue to grow. And now that you have told us all that we're supposed to go to the one at 24th and Mission, when we go to the Bay Area, that's the first one we go to. I now have the advice. I have it written down, and I'm ready to go. So uh, it's fantastic to catch up with you, and good luck in the title game in the NPSL. We will catch up with you soon, my friend. Be safe, be healthy, and good luck this weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and see you soon on 24th Mission. You got it. That's Santiago Lopez from El Fadalito. And uh, they are one of the great stories in the sport, and it is – uh, we, we found the story that CBS Bay Area ran on El Fadalito a couple weeks ago. 
from when the season started. We ran that in our NPSL weekly. See if I can find it, and we'll put it in once again in this particular uh, cut down because this will be on the app later today. And so what I'll do is I'll see if we can find the CBS Bay Area segment that ran, and we will put that in as a, as a part of the, the preview as well. Uh, Goal Morocco. And so they scored, and it looks like it's being reviewed. So it was. Uh, it might be 2-0, maybe not. So we'll see. Uh, Akomash with a goal on the board. And uh, Ezel Zuli was attached to it. So it is uh, a VAR check. So it is 2-0 pending the VAR review. Video assistant referee. Yeah, okay. So it is VAR review. Because I was going to say VAR review. Is that redundant? No. Uh, so they're checking if the... Uh, if possession was kept on the field, the ball did not go all the way over. Substitute coming in for the United States, a double substitution. And it is with about 30 to go. Mihailovic and Yao off, McGuire and Booth on for the United States. So a double switch. Mihailovic and Yao off, McGuire and Booth on. And it looks like the goal is going to stand. So it is 2-0 Morocco. Akomash with credit in the 63rd minute. So with about 25 to go in the quarterfinal, Morocco leads with the score of 2-0. So that is, that's where we are right now with the uh, United States. they got some work to do. Uh, catching you up on League's Cup and getting you ready for the weekend. Remember, today is a very, very busy day in the Olympic tournament. And after this match at 11 o'clock, so 28 minutes from now, in theory, the Morocco-USA match will have finished with 90-plus added time. Japan now is a plus 328 going up against Spain at 11 o'clock. Draws a plus 231. Spain is a minus 109. One o'clock, Egypt, underdog, but the numbers are closing. Egypt is a plus 194. Draw is a plus 215. Paraguay is a plus 150. Three o'clock, France, gotten a little bit better. They, instead of even money plus 100, they're at a minus 102 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Argentina, a decided underdog at a plus 293, and your draw, is a plus 238. The U.S. with work to do here, 68th minute, and a foul on Morocco as they lose possession inside the U.S. 18. And so the U.S. will have a free kick once again, 22 minutes plus added time by the ref on the clock to go. So uh, U.S. with some work to do down two goals in 22 minutes to go. All right, so uh, news in and around. Uh, Jamaica has named their new manager, Steve McLaren. McLaren spent some time as an advisor to the Jamaican national team. And so he, in his uh, release, he said that uh, when he got to spend that time as an advisor, that he got to uh, understand Jamaica as an entity and looks forward to uh, being the head coach of their national team. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is now looking for a manager as well for their national team as they let their manager go uh, at the same time, basically, that McLaren was hired by Jamaica. Uh, the Kraft Group, less than happy at the legislature with, uh, in uh, the Boston area, as Boston area has basically said no. Strongly worded criticism Thursday after the legislature failed to pass a measure before, before formal sessions ended, for the year that could have paved the way for the company to build a 25,000-seat stadium in Everett. And so they are deeply disappointed that uh, that did not happen. And so uh, bad news for the Crafts as they are trying to uh, bring a stadium in to uh, away from Foxborough. Our drive basically in between Providence and Boston. They wanted to do something in Everett. And it made it to the end of the negotiate the uh, legislative session before the legislature said no. The economic development mill did not move forward past the committee of ways and means. From the craft group themselves, Commonwealth missed the vital opportunity to clean up a brownfields site for an environmental justice community robbing the city of Everett and its community of the ability to remove a dilapidated and decommissioned power plant 
and remediate a site contaminated over the decades and replace it with a public park, waterfront access, and a privately funded soccer stadium, which was just one piece of this very significant project. Grateful for the willingness of Senate President Spilka and Senator D. Domenico to advance the project. Deeply disappointed the House would not take up the legislation on its own and that the legislature was unable to act on major legislation at the end of this session. This inaction on language that had no financial commitments from state or local government has halted the public process to determine the feasibility of this project before it could even begin. And passing this legislation was strictly about allowing us to start the process of determining the viability of this project for Everett. Massachusetts political landscape is one of the only places where creating opportunities in environmental justice communities and rehabilitation is dictated by the needs and bargaining of political leaders with outside influences. And we'd hoped for a different outcome for the citizens of Everett and environmental justice for that community. So obviously the craft group, not happy, not happy at all. So deeply disappointed after the state fails to move on the stadium idea in uh, Everett. So uh, that was an idea that they had, and uh, it is now going to stay an idea for the uh, foreseeable future as the craft uh, as the Kraft family continues to try and find places to build a soccer-specific stadium, although 25000 I think, is still too small, they wanted 25000 in Everett, and it did not work out. So we'll see what happens there with uh, any other possible ideas, but anything tied to the uh, – anything tied to this particular legislation is going to have to wait. It uh, looks like Ashraf Hakimi is going to be uh, making the rounds and saying hi and bye to everybody. And uh, or is he coming in to where the captain's armband? So uh, we have uh, another kick. And uh, Ashraf Hakimi scores in the 70th. And so now it's 3 0. So Morocco's up 3 0. And that's where we are for the United States with 20 minutes to go. So Hakimi scores, no substitution. So Hakimi wearing the captain's armband scores, 20 minutes to go. It's been a long day for, it's been a long second half, really long last couple of minutes. Substitution, Josh, Josh Atencio is in and Jack McGlynn is out. So 3-0 Morocco in the quarters with 20 minutes to go. So that's the uh, the next uh activity to keep an eye on the final 20 minutes for Morocco and the U.S. before the remainder of the day. Leagues Cup, what happened last night? We'll get you set up for what's happening this weekend with uh, Leagues Cup. We'd mentioned uh, the matchups heading into last night. Heavy matchups yesterday, Charlotte and Cruz Azul. Goalless after 90, Charlotte wins 4-2 in PKs. D.C. beats Santos Laguna 3-0. And so D.C., that's where D.C. is, and Santos Laguna comes to the uh, comes to Atlanta on Sunday afternoon. We know what Atlanta has to do. FC Juarez, 2-0 winners over Dallas. Mazatlan, 2-0 winners over Nashville. Tigres, 2-1 over Puebla. And L.A. in Cali Classico, 2-1 over San Jose two nights ago. Four matches yesterday. Cincinnati over Caretaro, 1-0. Salt Lake down to Atlas early, comes back to win that one 2-1. Toluca beats Chicago 3-1 at SeatGeek. And then Portland blows out Colorado 4-0. And that sets up the stage for tomorrow where you have three matches on Saturday. Tigres and and, uh, Messi and Friends, which is going to be the end friends, and that's at uh, NRG. That one's on Apple TV in season pass, 8 o'clock tomorrow night. 10 o'clock tomorrow night, The late one of the late games, Monterey and Pumas, is an elimination game. That is at Q2 in Austin. Anticipate a big crowd for that one. That should be a, that should be a really hot crowd. Monterey and Pumas at 10 o'clock. That one's on Univision and on the free side of Apple TV. Also on the free side of Apple TV, Vancouver and Tijuana. So Cholos goes to BC Place on the free side of Apple TV. That one's at 10 o'clock also. Sunday. Atlanta United, Santos Laguna. We mentioned what uh, what it looks like. And if Cincinnati wins, Cincinnati is going to host. If NYCFC wins, then it means if Atlanta beats Santos Laguna, that one goes to Bobby Dodd. 
8 o'clock on Sunday, Orlando and Atletico San Luis, Pachuca and Toronto FC. All of those are on season pass. Pachuca and Toronto is at BMO. Sunday night, 8 o'clock on the free side of Apple TV, Unimas and FS1. It is Philadelphia hosting Cruz Azul. St. Louis and FC Juarez is at City Park. That one's on season pass, 9 o'clock. Chivas and uh, LAG, that one is in Carson. That one's on season pass. And then it is Seattle and Nacoxa. That is late night, free side of Apple TV at Lumen Field. So the standings going into the weekend. Here's where we are. After last night, we can update things a little bit. It is uh, East 1, Cincinnati and NYC. Once again, we know what the situation is in the bracket. Querétaro eliminated. (coughs) One point in two matches. And so Cincinnati and NYC will determine what happens in East 1 and what happens if Atlanta United beats Santos Laguna. Uh, Michael is saying lots of tickets available for Sunday's match. 22 could be the lowest attendance at MBS, excluding COVID. We'll see. Uh, East two. Montreal has done it three points. Orlando and Atletico San Luis will determine if there's going to be chaos. If Atletico San Luis wins, then you're going into goal difference and things like that. Because right now, Orlando is at three points, and they've got a massive goal difference. If Atletico San Luis wins, that means in regulation, that means that they are at three points. And then obviously they would have a better goal difference than CF Montreal. So East two, Atletico San Luis needs a win, and it should mean a win and they would be in. Then it would be uh, Orlando and Atletico San Luis. Anything less than that means that Atletico San Luis is not advancing. East three. Messi and friends in Tigres to determine the one and the two. Puebla lost both of their matchups. They're eliminated. So this one's easy. Miami and Tigres to determine what happens, who goes where. Miami right now, both teams at three points, but Miami is one ahead in goal difference. So we'll see what happens there. East four. Philadelphia, Cruz Azul, last one on the board. Charlotte's in the barn at two points. So Cruz Azul... If they were to get a result, if they were to, you see, they would have to, and they would have to actually win because Charlotte with two points, Cruz Azul, if they end up getting a loss in penalties, you would assume that it goes to penalties with an even number. And so actually, no, if uh, Cruz Azul, I take it back. Charlotte's goal difference is at minus one. So scrap what I was just going to say. Charlotte's in the barn at two points. Cruz Azul, if they get a result in Philly, if they go to PKs, then they're in. If they go to PKs and lose, then it would still be a win and in because uh, then it would still be an in because you would get the one point for losing in penalties. And if you got to penalties in the first place, it would be because you had a tie score and you have a better goal difference right now than Charlotte. So literally, Cruz Azul needs a result. If my math is correct on this, if Cruz Azul gets a result, they would be in, Charlotte would be out, Cruz Azul would have a better goal difference than Charlotte over the two matches. Philadelphia, if they get any kind of a result, obviously, right now, they lead the, they lead the division, they lead the group. East four, three points compared to two compared to one. But Cruz Azul, the biggest thing for Cruz Azul is they need a result. They need a result, period. East five, Mazatlan is in the barn at three points. Nashville needs a result. They need a win, and they need a big win against New England. Win in regulation. Winning in PKs does them no good. So Nashville needs a win in regulation against New England, and they need to win big because New England right now, three points, one goal, uh, plus one in goal difference. Mazatlan is in the barn at three points after two matches, plus one in goal difference. Nashville has a minus two in goal difference. They need to win and win big, basically something akin to 3-0 to make up that goal difference to create some serious chaos. So Nashville, New England, Nashville needs to win and win big. 
to get in to be considered to look at math. But right now, Mazatlan, decent shape, three points, two matches, one plus one in goal difference. East six. We know East six, but we don't know the order. Red Bulls are out with the loss in uh, PKs. So it is uh, one po- uh, two points in, in two matches. Points per match with uh, one game played. Pachuca and Toronto, they each have one. So basically, they can have a kick about, and they figure out who's going where. So Pachuca and Toronto, we don't know who's the one or the two. We do know that they are both in and Red Bulls are out. East 7, once again, we know what co- what's going on with Atlanta. Atlanta, with a win, obviously they'd be at four points beating Santos Laguna. Santos Laguna, uh, if they were to, let's see. So if Atlanta gets a draw, one point, and if they were to lose in PKs, then it would go down to goal difference, and I still think Atlanta would get in. But what you really want to do is you need a result. D.C. is in five points in two matches. Atlanta, once again, they win. Depends on Cincinnati and NYC as to what happens next, but uh, we'll see what happens there. But Atlanta needs a result, then they don't need to worry about it. But Santos Laguna got blown out by D.C. in uh, their lone match. And so we'll see what happens with Atlanta on Sunday afternoon. That's the East. The West, Austin is in, two wins, six points, first two matches. Pumas and Monterrey is an elimination game. That's going to be a crazy elimination game at Q2 in the the, uh, Austin group in West 1. West 2, San Jose is in the barn at two points. L.A. and Chivas right now. Chivas lost in PKs. LAG won their lone match. So Chivas, in theory, if they get a point, they lose in PKs, they would be ahead of San Jose in goal difference. So needing a result. Halfway through the 82nd minute, Morocco still leads 3-0. LAG, right now they're okay. They're just trying to figure out, okay, if they get a result, then they'd be four points. And then the rest of the math is chaos in West 2 between Chivas and San Jose. Let them sort it out. West 3, Dallas eliminated. They lost their matchups to FC Juarez and to St. Louis City. So you're looking at FC Juarez and St. Louis trying to determine who is where. Someone's the one, someone's the two. They play each other to figure that out. Dallas eliminated. West 4, Chicago was eliminated after uh, last night and the loss to Toluca. Toluca and Kansas City have the one match to play between themselves to determine the one and the two out of West 4. So Toluca, one win plus two in goal difference, winning 3-1 against Chicago. Chicago lost their two matches, they're out. So Kansas City, with a plus one goal difference, would need to make that up if they're going to be the uh, the number one coming out of West 4. But Toluca and Kansas City, sporting Kansas City, will determine the one and the two out of West 4. West 5, we know Portland is in. They won their first two matches. Leon and Colorado, uh, that is an elimination game. Colorado's got a lot of work to do. No points, minus four in goal difference with the loss to Portland Timbers. So we'll see what happens with Colorado and Leon, but Colorado would have to win and win big. So keep an eye on that. West 6. Seattle. Three points, Minnesota with two. And uh, they have three points in two matches. So Minnesota's in with uh, two points, with uh, three points in two matches. They're done. Seattle, Nacoxa determines who does what. Right now, Nacoxa is at a same goal difference of Minnesota. So if Nacoxa gets a result in regulation, then they would be at three points and assume that they would have a better goal difference than Minnesota. Seattle gets a result, period. They get a draw. They get a point. Then that means that Nacoxa would be eliminated. Seattle would be the one. And then you would go on from there. West 7, LAFC, two matches played, four points. Vancouver and Tijuana to determine who would be the two. And uh, and if Vancouver wins in regulation, they would be the one. Vancouver and LAFC would be the two. 
So Vancouver wins in regulation in 90 minutes' time. They would be the one. LAFC would be the two. LAFC once again at four points through two matches. Tijuana needs a win in regulation, 90 minutes. And then they would be the two, and Vancouver would go home. Anything less than that, Tijuana could get a, if they were to win in PKs, but then you'd have a goal difference, I think, that wouldn't matter. So Tijuana really needs a result in 90 minutes. Because if they end up going to PKs, you would assume that the goal difference number would not be affected against the team that is with them in that match. So it would end up being, if Vancouver wins, they're the one LAFC is the two. If anything less, then Tijuana would be losing in goal difference. So LAFC would be the uh, one. Vancouver would be the two. Tijuana would be, uh, Cholos would be eliminated. West eight. RSL, three points, one match. Atlas is in the barn with uh, three points in two matches. And then Houston. So Salt Lake and Houston to determine what happens. Then um, if Houston gets a result in regulation, then you're going to goal difference, and then you're going to all kinds of chaos at that point. If RSL gets a result, period, if it goes to anything longer than 90 minutes, they are in, and Houston would be eliminated. So uh, the knockout round, as uh, uh, Michael is asking, Club America is, uh, is in. And I'm trying to see. So it would be just uh, be just Club America. Wow. Okay. So Club America would be the. All right. So hang on. I'm looking at the round of 32. Club America is in. They're waiting for an opponent. And uh, so hang on just a second. I'm now uh, leagues. Uh, so to your point, Michael, hang on just a second. So all of these match days, and I'm looking at the bracket, and it's not really helping any. So League's Cup, or tournament resources anyway. Introducing League's Cup. Um, 29 clubs, 18 MLS, officially sanctioned. Okay, two teams bypassing the group stage and have automatic spots in the round of 32. Crew and Club America. So those are the two that got forward. Just the the two champs. Two champs make their way through. You had the group tier structure. Club America is your top seed. Crew is the number six seed in the overall. But those are the only two teams that ended up with uh, buys to go into the second round. Winner of the third place match qualifies for CONCACAF. Both clubs in the League's Cup final automatically qualify for CONCACAF. The League's Cup 2023 champ qualifies directly to the round of 16 in CONCACAF. So that's so just those two teams, Crew and Club America, made it into the round of 16. But then they've got to figure out with like weighted systems and things like that who goes where and does what. So um, late 88th minute heading to the 89th, Morocco. Still leading 3-0. Long day for the United States. Once again, matches at 11, 1, and 3 as we carry our way forward. Very, very busy weekend across the board. Uh, what to watch, where to watch it, how to watch it. We'll do that just for today, maybe drift into tomorrow a little bit. But once again, thanks to our friends at El Fadalito and FC Motown for dropping by. That interview plus the link to the feature. Uh, that uh, CBS Bay Area did on El Fadalito at the beginning of the NPSL season. We'll put links to that, and we'll put that in uh, as the shows go. Remember, later today, our programming for USL Championship, League One, the League Two title game, which is in Peoria. We'll repost that interview and get you highlights of Seacoast United Phantoms and Asheville City. That will be going on. Uh, that'll be up on the network a little later today as well. And we'll also get back into life in, ML, in MLS Next Pro. Uh, let's see. Chance for uh, another VAR. And they're trying to see if a long launch or if a launch inside the, the 18 is going to be called a handball. 
as the uh, U.S. player. Looked like he was trying to uh, pull his hand back and review lends itself right hand exposed and it's going to be a penalty call and so it will be a handball call against the United States so the long day uh, the long day might be getting a little longer here the US is uh, less than pleased with the call so we'll see what happens uh, seems that they could have had no intra-league ties in the first round. Yeah, <laughs> I know, Michael. Spell check. It's one of those things that no one's a fan of. Uh, five minutes added for Morocco and the U.S. It'll be uh, yet another uh, penalty. And Tanner Tessman is uh, less than happy in discussing something with the captain for Morocco. And it looks like it's going to be... Mahroub, who will be taking the penalty for Morocco here at, in uh, in 90 plus one. And powered into the net. And so it is a penalty, a second penalty now in for uh, Morocco. And Mahroub converts. And it is now 4-0 Morocco over the United States. And we'll just uh, have the four other minutes for the United States. Made it out of group and ran into a very talented Morocco side here in the first round of the quarterfinals. So a uh, long day for the United States. And that will end here in a couple of minutes as they uh, are being shut out by Morocco. Right now, 4-0 with about four minutes to go. Uh, Summer Cup later today on CBS Sports Network. It is Gotham and Guadalajara at 8, Bay FC and Club America Femenil at 10.30. And Telemundo is also going to be simulcasting France and Argentina at 3. Two to NA also simulcasting Summer Cup at 8 and 10.30. Uh, season pass, busy night at MLS Next Pro. Busy afternoon starts at Chester. Philadelphia Union 2, FC Cincinnati 2 at 3. All caps and is hosting Ventura County FC at seven. Sporting Kansas City two at Rock Chalk Park is hosting White Caps two at eight, and uh, Austin FC two is hosting North Texas SC in a little bit of Copa Tejas MLS Next Pro style. That is at nine o'clock. MLSNextPro.com. NYCFC two on top of the parking deck at St. John's is hosting Crew two at eight fifteen. German Bundesliga B. Köln and uh, Hamburg at two thirty on the plus. Uh, CONCACAF U-20 Men's Championship USA and Panama is at 5.06 on Fox Soccer Plus. Paramount Plus, Argentine Primera has Newell's Old Boys and Estudiantes at 7. Summer Cup also on Paramount Plus at 8 and 10.30. All three matchups on Peacock at 11, 1, and 3. Spain, Japan, Egypt, Paraguay, France, and Argentina. Friends. Then uh, U-20s, you got USA, Panama at 5.06. Cuba and Mexico, that is at 10 o'clock. Tomorrow, BN's got a friendly with West Ham and Crystal Palace at 7 o'clock. If you don't have BN, uh, you can have BN, all the BNs, uh, Nuestra Tele, for the fans, CDO, uh, Teise, uh, Liga One Max, Liga One Max Pro. You can go to fanatisfntz.co slash soccer down here, and you can pick up Fanatis. And uh, they have now, I believe, added the Ecuadorian B League as well. You can catch our buddy Nino Torres, who is going to be calling uh, the Dutch League this weekend. That's going to get started. And so you can catch up with our buddy Nino on Gold TV as well. FanatisFNTZ.co slash soccer down here. Helps us out, helps them out. You turn into a, tr turn into a true degenerate when it comes to watching things uh, all across the planet and becoming more educated. Very, very cool stuff. Jason got me hooked. I blame him. Uh, Michael Parker has mentioned Detroit City and Rhode Island FC. That's at 4 o'clock on Big CBS tomorrow. And so that's at Keyworth, and so that will be a fun environment. And may the Parkhursts get in and get out and survive. CBS Sports Network tomorrow morning early, uh, Spurs and Bayern Munich in a friendly. Other friendlies, Manchester City, Chelsea at 5.30. Manchester United, Liverpool at 7.30. The Deuce has USL Championship and Sacramento as Pittsburgh Riverhounds visit at 10. FS2 has a Canadian Premier League doubleheader. Cavalry and Halifax Wanderers Forge in Ottawa at 4-7. ESPN Deportes has four friendlies tomorrow, 1, 3, 5, 30, 7, 30. 
Ren Rail, Sociedad Barrel, Betis, and Al Idihad are the first two. City and United are the other two. Fox Deportes has a men's club friendly at 10 a.m. Preston North End and Everton. Peru Primera at four. Comerciantes Unidos and Alianza Lima. Telemundo, remember, USA Japan tomorrow, 9 o'clock. Canada and Germany is at 1 o'clock. We'll go through juice boxes. We'll see if juice boxes exist for the women's side. Two to NA. Uh, Club America Aston Villa is at 5.30. Monterrey and Pumas in Leagues Cup is at 10. Universo has the Women's Olympics at 11 and 3. Spain, Colombia, France, and Brazil. <clears throat> Leagues Cup has season pass. Uh, season pass has Leagues Cup. Let me re- let me flip that. Uh, Tigris, Messi and Friends at 8. Monterrey, Pumas, Vancouver, and Cholos at 10. MLS Next Pro, two matchups. Carolina Core hosting OCB at 7.30. Chattanooga FC is uh, Toronto FC too. I believe that one is at York, and so that's a that's a haul for Chattanooga FC traveling to uh, York Lions Stadium on the campus of York University. More friendlies: Yokohama Marinos and Newcastle at eight, and Juventus and Brest at three. Atlanta United two and the Revs two. Remember that game is on while it's on MLSNextPro.com. It's also on ninety two nine the game. So uh, because of the double header on campus at Kennesaw State, uh, preseason friendly KSU and Mississippi State, late start for Atlanta United 2 and the Revs 2. Pre-game, 92.9 the game has a broadcast. Post-game show on the SDH Network after the fact. So it'll be a bit of a late night for us, but it'll be fun. So if you can make it to the fraction, make it to the fraction for Atlanta United 2 and Revs 2, 8.30. Should be cooler then it would be otherwise you won't be dealing with all the heat issues that are there that we see. Morocco advances to Monday at noon, and they made it to the men's semifinals. So they're a part of the first semifinal. With the matchup coming up involving Japan, that will be the semifinal opponent for Morocco. Once again, Women's Olympics on NBCSports.com. ESPN has Bundesliga B, a bunch of friendlies on Saturday, everything in the USL Championship with seven matches. Five matchups in USL League One. Paramount Plus tomorrow has Primera, Club Friendly, Scottish Premiership with Hearts and Rangers in USL Championship. And once again, Peacock has all four matchups involving the uh, involving the uh, women's side of things. All right. So um, let's see. How do we do we do world? Is that how this works with uh, the the five ring circus? Olympic Games women. Okay, so here we go. Uh, USA uh, minus 156 going up against Japan is a plus 370. Spain and Colombia at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Spain big favorite at a minus 357. 1 o'clock Canada, a plus 209 going up against Germany, who's a plus 117. And 3 o'clock France going up against Brazil at a minus 145. Brazil is a plus 345. Remember, no Marta because of the red card. Uh, gossip, rumor, and innuendo before we get out of here. Uh, Michael, you said in the Twitch pitch, uh, less uh, M- Liga MX team seems like Leagues Cup could have no intra-MX ties, possibly. Uh, I, but there's still some uh, juggling with matchups, and so we'll see how it uh, we'll see how it uh, works itself out. But, yeah, it was a substandard showing last year for Liga MX sides, and so we will see. Uh, what it looks like with Liga MX this season. We do have a team that's been eliminated already. We'll see. But we also had some MLS teams eliminated. So we'll see what happens involving uh, – we'll see what happens involving all of the uh, the sides as we get through this first weekend of Liga MX. All right, so gossip rumor and innuendo before we get out of here and lay it all on the line for a Friday. Uh, once again, so – Saturday night, pregame, twos and revs two. Matchup on 92.9 the game. Postgame show SDH Network. So it's like everything is going to be there for the revs two and Atlanta United two as Atlanta United two tries to put a couple of wins together uh, at home against uh, New England Revolution two. So gossip, rumor, and innuendo for today. West Ham. Closing in on the double signing of Borussia Dortmund, Germany striker Nicholas Fulkrug, and Crescencio Somerville from Leeds. Arsenal, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, all interested in Andre and, uh, Adrian Rabio, free agent after leaving Juve. Villa reached a deal with Chelsea for Romelu Lukaku. 
but he wants to join Napoli instead. West Ham have agreed to personal terms to Aaron Juan Bissaka, but have yet to agree to a fee with Manchester United, who won 18 million pounds rather than the 10 million offered. Also, Fulham and advanced talks to sign Villarreal's Jorge Cuenca for 6.7 million pounds. Napoli have an offer of 12 million euro ready for Brighton. Uh, midfielder Billy Gilmore waiting for players to leave the club before making it. Arsenal close to a 25 million pound deal to sign Mikel Marino from Real Sociedad. Roma have agreed with Girona, Girona to sign Artem Dovbik for 28.8 million pounds with AC Milan interested in signing Roma's England forward Tammy Abraham. Stuttgart will withdraw their interest in Brighton's Denny Undav and look at new targets soon if they can't reach a deal with uh, Albion. Newcastle in advance talks with Sheffield United to sign their 20-year-old Danish striker William Osula for an initial uh, 10 million pounds. Leipzig rejecting a second bid for uh, Danny Olmo. And where is my... Oh, okay. So my... uh, Also on the board, uh, Bristol City, Stoke, Birmingham, interested in Burnley defender Luke McNally. Stoke want uh, Blackburn midfielder Lewis Travis. Forrest are not looking to cash in on Morgan Gibbs-White, despite interest from Newcastle, Arsenal, Villa, and Chelsea. Manchester City's Jacob Wright, 18, has agreed to a loan deal to Posh, otherwise known as Peterborough United. Newcastle have opened negotiations with Crystal Palace over a move to sign Mark Gahey. Manchester United have submitted an opening double offer to sign Matisse De Ligt and Nusser Masraoui from Bayern Munich. And so that is a gossip rumor and innuendo. Thanks to our friends at the BBC and with the uh, Athletic and the Athletic Overseas. So that is uh, yet another Friday. And thanks to another great week to all of you guys. Uh, it's been a fun week, as always. Busy on Saturday and Sunday. Hoping to see a lot of you around this weekend, whether it's at the Fraction or whether it is at Mercedes-Benz for the summer of soccer as the summer of soccer continues. Uh, Thanks to all of our guests this week. It's been a great week. Abe Gordon uh, catching up with Peoria City. Tyler, uh, Tyler Pilgrim from Scarves and Spikes. Our friends at FC Naples yesterday, Matt Poland, Bob Moreno, uh, Nino and Nico. Bart joining us from uh, Fado Midtown as he was watching the early sections of uh, Team USA and Morocco. Michael Parkhurst from a Beyond Goals Mentoring as he was styling in his Rhode Island FC gear and his USA jersey. And our friends from FC Motown and El Fadalito. Santiago Lopez, head coach at El Fadalito, GM Gregory Irwin from FC Motown as they get ready for the NPSL title game. And as always, thanks to all of you guys for uh, being a part of what we do every single week. Couldn't do it without you. And we'll be doing it again all weekend. We'll be doing it again on Monday. Keep an eye out on the SDH app for all of our content. Great interviews. We caught up with Aiden McFadden. Maddie did. Caught up with uh, the beach volleyball national team side of things. And it's been great conversations uh, as we go. So set your notifications. You'll know when we get something new. We'll get uh, another 1v1 out there for you. You'll know when they happen. You get to listen to it, pass the word. And it's uh, released on all the SDH social media platforms across the board. And uh, hopefully by Monday... I will have finally beaten this summer cold. So since it is a Friday, that means that we get to uh, do one final thing before we get out of here. So enjoy the long Friday. And we'll be back at it again. Uh, Have a good weekend. Thank you, Unc. Give this a listen. You might remember some things. And we'll see you again here first thing Monday morning on the morning show here on the SDH Network. So as we play ourselves out, enjoy. We'll catch up with you soon. The war was on. Ah, the keys on the typewriter had sharp points that kept sticking into our fingers. The dictating equipment started asking us questions. And our beepers sent electric shocks just through our body like a cattle prod. Out in the warehouse, the trucks kept banging into the docks. Not even thinking about stopping. Oh, our frail bodies were strapped to the chairs, and our chairs were chained to the desks. Our pleas for justice were ignored, and the end seemed near. But we busted our slave drivers.
those little bitty balls. We've charged out of their brick fortress. The streets are ours be gone.